Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. San Diego football fans want to know what's next for the Chargers. Will they leave town? They ended what could be their last season in San Diego yesterday, missing the playoffs again and finishing last in their division. In response, the team fired its head coach. KPBS's Matt Hoffman tells us what's next. Yesterday, the Chargers fired head coach Mike McCoy after finishing the season with only five wins. Today, a team press conference was held at the team's practice facility. President of Football Operations John Spanos fielded questions about moving the team to Los Angeles. Whenever an announcement is made, is out of my control. So I'm really going to worry about right now the things I can't control. And that's, that, that's correct. What's happening with the future of this organization? I didn't say I had no clue. What I said was, uh, you know, as far as when the announcement's made, it's out of my control. While L.A. was brought up multiple times by reporters, General Manager Tom Telesco reminded fans the team is focused on the front office. Well, to us, the, the Los Angeles part, any relocation, that's separate from, from the head coach search. The NFL has set a January 15th relocation deadline for the Chargers. For KPBS News, I'm Matt Hoffman. Alcohol police are investigating a shooting involving one of their officers. It happened last night, and right now, there's no word on the condition of the man the officer shot. Police say they got a call about a man standing in traffic at 2nd and Oakdale, and when they contacted him, they say he pulled a knife. Officers tried to stun him, but they say they shot him when he lunged at them. The incident was recorded by a body camera, and the police department says that video will be part of the investigation. Mexican officials say 2016 was the most violent year in Tijuana's history with more than 900 people killed. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has the story. The rising Jalisco New Generation Cartel is fighting the Sinaloa Cartel for control of the cross-border drug trade. The violence led to more than 900 killings, surpassing the former record of 844 in 2008. The city has been struggling since 2008 to fix its reputation. I spoke to David Shirk of Justice in Mexico about what this means for Tijuana. It's disheartening to see those efforts to, to you know, celebrate the culinary arts in Tijuana, to celebrate its, its innovation and manufacturing capability. Uh, it's very disheartening to see those efforts sullied by a resurgence of this violence. The main difference between killings in 2016 and killings in 2008 is visibility. In 2008, downtown restaurants and bars were regular scenes of violence. Now, killings are concentrated in the outskirts of Tijuana, in poor neighborhoods. Shirk says officials need to change their focus from the drug war toward creating jobs for young men. He says there also needs to be more collaboration between the government and civic associations to fight impunity. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Mexico's central bank says a record amount of U.S. dollars were wired to Mexico in November. Mexicans living abroad sent nearly $2.4 billion to their families in Mexico. These transfers are, are called remittances. Bank officials say the increase is due to a weak peso and fears President-elect Donald Trump will stop remittances altogether. Gas prices are also on the rise in Mexico, going up as much as 20 percent over the weekend. In response, protesters have been blocking roads and gas stations. The increase is because of a government price deregulation as Mexico starts privatizing its oil industry. House Democrats make a plea to save the Affordable Health Care Act. Today, House, speak, House, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi spoke to reporters and tweeted to ask voters to, quote, take a second look. She says repealing Obamacare would leave millions of Americans without health insurance and with no real alternative. This plea comes a day before Congress convenes, and Pelosi says the GOP begins its assault on the law. Republicans are set to adopt changes to the House rule to make it easier to repeal the law. Nearly one million San Diego County residents are enrolled in Medi-Cal, the health plan for low-income people. But the county also has one of the lowest percentages of doctors who will take Medi-Cal patients compared to other regions in California. I spoke with iNews Source reporter Cheryl Clark about the problem. Cheryl, you looked at two surveys of California doctors. What do they find? These surveys were of doctors uh, renewing their licenses. 
they were asked whether they were willing to accept new Medi-Cal patients or any Medi-Cal patients. And were they? Well, not enough of them. This county has fewer specialists like orthopedic surgeons or gastroenterologists who are willing to accept new Medi-Cal patients than any other area in California. And for primary care doctors, San Diego had the third lard lowest proportion of physicians in the state accepting new Medi-Cal patients. So how does this affect the patients and the doctors working to care for these patients? Well, we spoke with Dr. Jim Schultz. He's the chief medical officer with Neighborhood Healthcare in Escondido. And his clinic is one of several that shoulder the load of primary care for the increasing number of Medi-Cal patients. But there's a struggle to find specialists when testing reveals patients need follow-up care. He says they often need to be seen within a few days, not a few weeks or months. Well, there's a lot of reasons. One is if there's something bad wrong, it can get worse if it takes six months to get to see a specialist. I mean, it can go from not so bad to bad, or it can go from bad to really horrible. So why are so few doctors willing to see Medi-Cal patients? Well, as the saying goes, it's all about the money. Doctors treating a Medi-Cal patient are paid about one-third what they get for treating a Medicare patient and far less than what they're paid for care of a person with private insurance. There's a lot more on this story online at inewsource.org. iNewsource reporter Cheryl Clark, thank you. A new California law to help sexually exploited minors is causing controversy. Senate Bill 1322 went into effect January 1st. It keeps minors from being arrested and charged with prostitution. Instead, in some circumstances, a judge may decide to place them with California's Department of Social Services. Critics include California Assemblyman Travis Allen. He wrote a piece in the Washington Examiner claiming the law legalizes child prostitution by keeping the minors soliciting sex on the streets therefore making it easier for pimps. California State Senator and bill sponsor Holly Mitchell is blasting the claim on Twitter, saying underage prostitutes are victims and the new law keeps them from being re-victimized through prosecution. Hundreds of small quakes have rattled Imperial Valley since New Year's Eve. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy talked to earthquake expert Pat Abbott about whether these minor tremblers could lead to a big one. A series of more than 300 earthquakes has struck under the desert town of Brawley near the Mexico border, 130 miles east of San Diego. The seismically active region connects the San Andreas and Imperial Faults. Both are capable of major quakes, but this cluster of magnitude threes and twos is not necessarily a precursor, says Pat Abbott. He's a professor emeritus of geology at San Diego State University and a lecturer with the Smithsonian. For five and a half million years, Baja California San Diego are pulling away from Mexico, and that ex is experienced with hundreds or thousands of earthquakes in these swarms in the warm rock in the Brawley area. Do these small earthquakes lead to the big ones? Oh, they might. You never know what day we're going to have a big earthquake in, in California. Similar clusters of quakes hit near the region in September and October. The most recent large quake to strike Brawley was a magnitude 5.4 in 2012. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. San Diego's annual Fleet Week may be in danger. An analysis by the San Diego Union-Tribune reveals the nonprofit foundation that runs the event is out of money. The Fleet Week Foundation was nearly $150,000 in the red at the end of 2015, and now the board is negotiating with creditors to settle the foundation's debts. Officials with the foundation say they may have already agreed, many have already agreed to settle. Thousands of fans showed up to watch the annual Rose Bowl Parade in Pasadena. Some camped out in the rain last night for the best spot today. The top winner was the Spirit of Hawaii. A float displayed waterfalls, a princess with fiery hands, and a working volcano. Officials say the parade route had extra security this year to prevent high-speed vehicles from getting too close. The floats will remain on display until tomorrow during the showcase of the floats. Wedding bells rang in the new year for San Diego Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez. Yesterday, she married former, former Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher. He tweeted the news out along with a wedding picture. The wedding was a surprise for their guest who thought they were going to a birthday party for Fletcher, who turned 40 the same day. 
Last year, we told you about an effort to start a Buddhist fraternity and sorority at San Diego State University. Now, KPBS reporter Claire Tregas there brings us an update. She says it's going strong and is expanding to UC San Diego. Anyone's mind race all day long, just thinking and thinking and thinking? not going to stop your racing mind. When Jeff Zlotnick had the idea to start a Buddhist fraternity at SDSU, even he thought it seemed a little far-fetched. He wasn't sure students would be interested, let alone commit themselves to leading the organization. Now he's in awe of what's happened. It's become real. It's kind of like in these 15 months, this little vision and idea we had took off. The Delta Beta Tau co-ed fraternity has more than 50 members and recently initiated 19 new pledges. To pledge, students must commit themselves to meetings for group meditation two nights a week, going on day-long meditation retreats, and doing community service. We had some rituals, uh, which of course are, you know, private within Delta Beta Tau stuff, but even that's fun. Zlotnik isn't a student, but helps run a Buddhist store near campus called Buddha for You. He says after his initial idea, students took over the leadership and now are running more of Delta Beta Tau on their own. I'm thrilled to see the students take this so seriously. I'm thrilled to see how much it's truly impacted their lives. Uh, initiation night to hear them share stories and to break down in tears and laughter at how much this has impacted their lives. Uh, it's really profound. Next, they are looking at establishing a fraternity house for Delta Beta Tau members to live in, though Zlotnick says that's at least a year away. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. The group is also launching at UC San Diego with a small meeting once a week. Gray skies covered Oceanside today as cloud ca clouds cast shadows over the coast, and it looks like cloudy weather is a trend this week for San Diego. Sinead Shocker has tonight's forecast. Happy New Year to all of the viewers at home. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. We will continue to see things go downhill as we head towards Tuesday, Wednesday. What's going on? We are watching an area of low pressure as it continues to spread moisture across northern and central California. Some of that moisture will also be popping up in our region, especially as we as we head towards Tuesday and Wednesday. But one thing we're mostly going to notice for tonight is plenty of cloud cover. Here's a closer look at the counties, we already have plenty of clouds with most of the showers remaining northbound, impacting Long Beach, places like Los Angeles as well. Rather cloudy into tonight, lows in the upper 40s. As we head towards Oceanside, they too will see a temperature in the 40, right around 43 degrees. Over in Ramona, you're at 40, Mount Laguna at 33, Campo at 38. Here's what's in store on Tuesday. That same disturbance will continue to prompt heavy rounds of rain across northern and central California. Once again, we do run the risk to see some of that moisture move into Southern California, bringing the return of a couple of showers across our region. Another thing we will notice is warmer temperatures. We'll be in the lower 60s across the coast. Lots of cloud cover here for Tuesday. The cloudy skies continuing Wednesday and even into the day on Thursday. But it's not until the second half of the work week where we do have the possibility to have some showers returning to the San Diego area. Further inland, highs will be in the mid 60s pretty much for the rest of the next few days. We'll see the chance for clouds and maybe breaks of sunshine here on Tuesday. Partial sunshine as we head towards Wednesday by Thursday. It'll be an overcast start to our Thursday and then we do have the chance for some of those showers to arrive inland by late Thursday afternoon. Out in the mountains highs will be in the 40s and then we quickly warm up Wednesday Thursday. We're still in the 50s into the day on Friday. Lots of sunshine here. Spotty showers arriving to the mountains by Saturday and this is going to be a, a just a rain event as temperatures are set to be in the 50s and as we approach the start of the weekend over in the desert. Take a look at this. Really not bad. We'll see highs in the lower 60s on Tuesday with more clouds than sun. Those clouds will be breaking for some more sunshine by midweek and highs will be flirting with that 70 degree mark. We finally break into the 70s on Thursday, but we do have the chance for just a shower in the area. Finally, on Friday, we're drying out nicely. Lots of sunshine around and then the next chance for a shower or two will arrive for the start of the weekend out on the deserts. KPBS, Larissa Abreu.
I'm Hari Srinivasan. On the next news hour, we began our look back at President Obama's terms in office, the Obama years. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. We've been looking back at some of our best stories of the past year, and one of them, Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero introduced us to a community of American women living in Tijuana while working in the U.S. or sending their children to school here. They live in Mexico because their husbands were deported and struggle with long waits at the border. They say they're denied access to a program that would shorten those waits. Okay, so we're getting ready to leave. I know you and guys. Here we are. Be careful, God bless you. We tried to go earlier this morning, but it was super hot and the line was super long. Bridget Borges is used to waiting hours at the San Ysidro border crossing. It is. But for her children, this. it's torture. <laughs> the family lives part time in North San Diego County. Okay. When their father was deported to Mexico 12 What's years ago, on? Bridget considered moving everyone to Tijuana. But her oldest son, Aaron, has autism. Bridget felt she had to keep him in a U.S. school. I said he doesn't speak Spanish. Um, he has uh, difficulty in, in uh, learning, and he won't be able to make it out there. Aaron says he wishes his father could live in the U.S. I miss him so much, and it makes me so sad. Bridget recently applied for the Century Trusted Traveler program, which would let her cross the border in a fraction of the time. But U.S. Customs and Border Protection told her she didn't qualify because she was married to a deported man, making her high risk. I got emotional there. I did start to cry, and I said, look, if it's an issue where you think I'm going to try to cross him through Century, it's not going to happen. I go, I know the risk. I'm not stupid. She says she wouldn't risk jail time because her children depend on her. U.S. Customs and Border Protection declined to comment for this story. Immigration lawyer Nicole Ramos says the agency regularly denies sentry to people with deported spouses. So essentially you have the U.S. government punishing these families twice. Ramos says there's no policy prohibiting spouses of deportees from getting sentry, but that they're regularly denied it because of concerns they'll try to smuggle their husbands across the border. She says these are the people who could most benefit from sentry because of their cross-border lives. I know women that have developed back problems while sitting in the line, women that have developed anxiety problems from sitting in the line. It's exactly 6.01 right now. Alicia Lopez is one of those women. She passes the hours by flipping through radio station after radio station. I had a breakdown. I just had an anxiety attack. And to shake that off at work, it took a few hours. It just it did linger. She works every weekday in the U.S. at the San Ysidro Health Center. Lopez is the primary breadwinner in her family. She gets up at 5 a.m. to get to work at 9. In the evenings, she returns to her children and their Mexican father in Tijuana. She says she's often afraid of losing her job because she's never sure she's going to make it to work on time. Come on, let's go. Lopez also applied for the Century Trusted Traveler program. The border agent told her she would never qualify because she was married to a deported man at the time. Thank you. I have no criminal record. I have no, uh, nothing on my driving record. I have nothing. I mean, a good employment history, everything. Here's Puppy's house. On a recent Monday, Puppy. Bridget Borges and her children were reunited with her husband in Tijuana. ¿Cómo les fue? Yeah. Bien. Bien. Not too bad this time. Oh, okay. They quickly absorbed themselves in family routine. All right. Eduardo fed the baby, No. while Bridget made copies for a class she was teaching that evening at a nearby church. Six copies to make. It's cuando ella está, me siento bien. When she's here, I feel good. I feel a family. The house feels different. I have my kids. Los niños, los tengo. The couple showed me photos of their complicated history. So this is 99. Months after their wedding, Eduardo was deported for a drug offense he'd committed decades before as a young man. He had since become a pastor. It was a challenge, and at the same time, I was sure it was a challenge I had to overcome. If I really believed in God, I was going to be able to succeed. Otherwise, my faith was not real faith. Okay, baby, come on in. The family goes to Eduardo's church in Tijuana every time they're together. Bridget thinks if it weren't for their faith and Eduardo's preaching, they wouldn't have been able to make their cross-border lives work. When they feel despair, they turn to the Bible. And Bridget tries to pass on those lessons to her okay. kids. 
and to children at the church, where she teaches classes. If God wasn't that center in our lives, things just would collapse. It would. Eduardo says the hardest part is not being able to play an active role in his children's lives in the U.S. I've never had the happiness of taking my son to school. All of that. I missed it. Yeah, he missed all of that. Bridget plans to reapply for Century in case the next border agent sympathizes. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Holly, Hollyweed, that was what the iconic Los Angeles Hollywood sign read on New Year's Day. Someone placed two giant tarps over two O's to make them appear as two E's. Los Angeles police are calling this a prank, but they are investigating. The prankster was caught by surveillance cameras and faces a misdemeanor trespassing charge. The tarps were removed by midday. Maybe you're looking for a non-traditional workout as part of your New Year's resolution to get fit. If so, then KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando is suggesting you try Tempest Free Running Academy in Vista for a full body workout that includes parkour, free running, and defying gravity. What's parkour? Simply put, it's moving from point A to point B in a fast and efficient manner. actually technique of how to overcome obstacles in front of you. If you say you have a wall, you have a small wall, a tall wall, if you need to go under a bar, there's actually proper techniques. So if you didn't know that technique and you were to race me, I would beat you. And free running, it's that plus a little more, it's a little more creative. Um, so you have flips and it's a little more style. It's really, really what we call like parkour vision. You really learn awareness and how to, how to think spatially. So if there's an obstacle in the way, you could either go around it or you could hop over it or you can vault over it. Seeing that world in that way, like one giant playground is amazing. As a professional stuntman, Fernando J. Huerta sees not just a playground, but a creative canvas where parkour is an essential tool. For a stuntman, a lot of movies and television shows, a lot of agents and casting directors these days are looking for parkour. It's a necessary skill if you want to break into the film and television industry as a stuntman. Tempest Academy provides the perfect place for him to work on job skills. The foam pit is the safest piece of equipment that allows you to do high falls or flips. And when I started learning stunts, I would flip over and pretend that there's, there's an explosion, flip over and land in the foam pit. I just, I hate going into the foam pit. It's, it's really hard to get out of. He also worked on his wall flip with Tempest Academy gym manager, James Paw. A wall flip is a move where you jump on a wall and then do a backflip. So there's always a way to practice a movement uh, in a soft, safe environment before bringing it to a um, hard or like real life outdoor type of situation. It's a very difficult move that requires hopping on it and just flipping out of it. And this facility provides that level of safety in order to learn how to do that. And um, I've been working on that for quite a while and I just got it yesterday because using this facility really helps train that and train your confidence in doing a wall flip. It's also great for the beginner of any age. When we start in the basic beginner's class, um, we're working on jumping, landing, climbing, uh, rolling, and vaulting, basically. So just basically navigating through your environment efficiently. There's lots of different ways to vault over obstacles or um, kind of bypass obstacles. Yes, this is definitely a full body workout. And more importantly, it's a very functional full body workout. You're basically just working every, every muscle you can really. So as you can see right behind me, we have, a, we have the Tempest Air. It's where we teach our, most of our wall tricks. Um, the way it's shaped, um, it allows uh, our students to, to step on the wall, 
um, climb on the wall, climb on the airplane, a little bit easier than a, than a vertical wall because of the curvatures. Okay, at the higher levels, um, that is where we, we really introduced more of the free running parts in our curriculum with basically more flipping and the more, maybe not so efficient movement, more creative movements. Our goal was to actually take a beginner student, go through our whole system, all seven levels, and when, by the time you graduate from here, you're pretty badass. Co-owner and coach Victor Lopez says parkour offers more than just a workout. It's a philosophy of life that suggests any obstacle can be overcome and overcome with style and creativity. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. It happened again. A San Diego mother rang in the new year, giving birth to twin girls in two different years. One baby was born on Saturday, minutes before midnight 2016. The other was born at midnight 2017. A similar thing happened one year ago on New Year's Eve when a mother gave birth to a girl and boy one minutes before midnight and the other right after. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.